National Insurance Clearinghouse, the marketing arm of Brokers Alliance presents a Bravo video event, the Business Insurance Zone, dedicated to financial professionals who use insurance in their practice. And now the host of the Business Insurance Zone, the Wiz of the Biz, insurance columnist, Steve Savant. Let's talk about today about tax-free income because that is exactly what we're going into in a huge way. We own that space right now. And I want to bring up a few ideas, a few comments so that you can understand where we're going on this. About 10 years ago, I wrote an article that appeared in Broker's World. In that article in Broker's World, I wrote a piece about 1035. So it was a simple concept. I got a call from an attorney who said, I'd like you to examine a case, a case that I have on a man who's 94 years old, whose contract is coming due in seven months. Did you get what I just said? So I said, okay, but what am I supposed to do with it? And he says, well, we want to exchange it to another policy because the maturity date in this policy ends in seven months. I said, well, first of all, nobody issues past age 90. I said, why don't you send me the enforced ledger? So he sends me the enforced ledger. It's a participating whole life contract that has about 690 grand in policy loans on it. And throughout the entire history of distributions, did the client pay the interest? No. So it was cannibalizing the cash values inside the contract. So when I got done, I called the attorney back and I said, well, here's the situation. If your client lives seven more months, he's going to have a tax bill, ordinary income tax bill at 649,000. That's the ordinary and another 400 grand in policy loans and phantom income. If this guy's not dead by then, he'll want to be. When I do a tax advantage contract, I'm always making sure that the contract maturity date goes out to either the phrase is 121 guaranteed in the contract or, or the life of the insured. Some contracts allow you to buy no lapse loan provisions, but I'm always looking to see which turns out the best. So when you do no tax, I mean no tax. So I have to keep the policy in force for the life of the insured, otherwise I'm gonna face a phantom income, ordinary income tax, not only on what the client took constructive receipt on, but also anything inside the policy since I don't know anybody, anybody that's paying the interest. Do you? Not out of pocket. Number two, and it's a big issue, we have no ordinary income tax. This is never going to show up on your 1040 if you do this correct. So if I'm taking out strategic policy loans of gain and withdrawals to basis, my client is not going to pay a taxable event as long as the contract's kept in force. And by the way, a small heads up. How many realize, how many sell tax income for tax-free income or tax advantage? Who's going to manage the distribution on that? I'm just curious. You realize that every year we're going to have to order an enforce ledger. I, I, okay, I just sucked the air out of the room. Do you realize we're going to have to order an enforce ledger every year? Recalibrate the cash value to the target that you said, whether it was 90, 95, age 100. There's already one carrier on the street that has decided to auto-plate this into their administration, and that's going to be a huge issue, and we're hoping that the industry wakes up to this. Otherwise, you and I, or although maybe I'll be retired by then, but somebody's going to have to call for those illustrations and the enforced ledger every single year. How many knew that's going to happen? Look at, the, look at the audience. Look how many people raise their hand and look how many people are raising their hand now. Nobody. This is a huge issue and it's going to be an admin nightmare. We're already at Brokers Alliance. We're trying to anticipate this and work out a system that we can actually bring to you that will make this work auto-plated. The third thing I want to talk about today on taxes, and it's really interesting, we don't pay any early penalties. There's no 10%. We're not under ERISA. So we don't have the same issues, whether it's a 10% penalty before 59 and a half, or we're subject to the RMD qualifications of 70 and a half. We don't have any of those issues because we're not under the jurisdiction of ERISA. So when I go to my client, I say no phantom income, no ordinary income tax, no ERISA issues of early withdrawal or RMDs. 
And here's a one that I really want you to start thinking of because I got stopped in the CPA Society when I was speaking it there. And by the way, just a little side note, some of you have seen him on, you met him last night. Please welcome, just to give a, hand, a warm welcome to Ken Davis, CLU, CHFC, CFP, CPA, and has been in my study group for almost 24 years, Ken. <laughs> Ken got me at my first gig at the CPA Society. I told him I wouldn't do it because I knew they could eat my lunch. He convinced me to speak anyways. It was an eight-hour mind-numbing introduction into life insurance in front of CPAs. I have to say, the only other group that was tougher was the enrolled agents of the IRS at the Vegas convention. I never saw the tax facts on toilet paper memorabilia, and I'm not kidding. I got stopped in the middle of my tax-free recital at the CPA Society, and the guy raised his hand. He goes, excuse me, Steve, excuse me, Steve. Isn't life insurance subject to the alternative minimum tax in a corporate setting? Is it not a preference item? And I thought to myself, well, I, have never, I've, I, I haven't thought about that in years. And sure enough, in certain situations, in certain corporate entities, a death benefit proceed that would come inside a corporation could be treated as a preference item, and therefore, it would be what? Subject to the AMT. But I told them, as far as a non-modified endowment contract, taking withdrawals to basis and policy loans to gain, you will never be subject to the corporate AMT tax because it'll never be treated as a preference item because as Joe Cessary said, it's a living benefit. The only thing that's subject to it in that regard would be the death benefit itself. Now, why I'm talking about AMT, just remember, when I am up against other tax-free income, I compare it to something like this. How many have so sold mutual or, um, municipal bonds? And how many have seen portfolios where clients have municipal bonds? I have too. And the last one I saw, the client had 1.4 million in assets, 600K of it was in municipal, municipal bonds. If you don't know anything about the client, and this is your first time looking at his portfolio, what can you deduct from reading that this guy's got 600K in muni bonds over a $1.4 million portfolio? What is your first psychological profile on the agent or the client? He hates paying taxes. He doesn't have a small disposition. He's got a hatred for it. Now, I don't know about you, but anytime I see psychological profiles like that, what am I going to play to? I'm going to play to his phobia on taxes. So I told the gentleman, please send me your 1040. I'll take the first two pages. He sent me his 1040. I pulled the second page, and I noticed... I noticed he's paying AMT tax on municipal bonds. What's with that? So I called the gentleman back, and I was a young man at the time, 15 years ago, about 45, and the, um, the man I was talking to was about 70-something years of age, and he told me, young man, I bought municipal bonds so that I wouldn't pay taxes. I said, well, sir, I appreciate that, but if you just turn to your second page, you'll notice you have an AMT on some of these municipal bonds. And he goes, are you telling me that I'm paying taxes on my municipal bond. Yes, sir, you're paying the AMT. Do you know what the revelation is on this? Are you guys getting this? Some municipal bonds are subject to the AMT, and the clients don't even get that. And what happens if that AMT, what's, is that going to come on my income? Could that fall on my income for my Social Security benefits to get taxed? Just think about what I'm saying. When we talk about tax-advantaged income, I'm talking about all-in. And I want you to get a new phrase. It's called net spendable income. More take-home pay. And why do I say that? Because Google Analytics says that's what shows up on page one and two. You need to learn the language of the internet. You need to become Googleites. You need to think about how you're going to talk to clients because they are going, let me tell you something. How many in here are baby boomers, 46 to 64? Raise them, keep them up. Raise them, keep them up. That's our largest demographic right now. But good news, all of us who are baby boomers are now being called Googleites. Because whatever I say, what are you going to do when, your client, when you're done with your client? What's he going to do? What's she going to do? They're going to go right out to the internet and Google it. And you're going to be talking about some high-end MBA language, and that's not the language of your client. So you need to get into net spendable income, more take-home pay. And when I say that my tax-advantaged 
income coming from a life insurance contract. That's a non-modified contract. When I say it's tax-free, I mean no AMT, no ordinary income tax, no phantom gain, as long as you do it the way I said. All these issues are a huge potpourri of tax advantages. But let me give you another one. And here's one that Ken and I did on the show, and I got to tell you, this is revolutionary. Why do people like capital gains versus ordinary income tax? Just why? They pay less. So I have a client that has a $10,000 capital gain, and he's trumpeting his 15% gain. He only has to pay $1,500 of his $10,000. And he's celebrating this in front of me because my life insurance, right, I have costs that exceed $1,500. $1,500 in my actual internal costs with cost of insurance, right? My M&E, my policy fee, my front end loans. I fully admitted it. But I said, but heads up, your capital gains caused an ordinary income tax event. And he goes, you're high. And I said, I don't do dope anymore. <laughs> One day when I met Joe, keyword, yeah, thank you. One day when I met Joe, Joe goes, I have this case for you, Steve. You seem to be very eloquent in the areas of illegal pharmaceuticals. I said, I am very well versed in impaired risk, and that just happens to be my specialty. In fact, I got to say, we, most carriers don't do the uh, hair follicle test anymore for cocaine. So since we're not paying for it anymore, it used to be a $150 uh, test. I just say, tilt the guy's head up into the light, and the partition between his nostrils is gone. You know you got a problem. And if somebody will get me a water, I'll take a, a water, too, because I need a water up here. Think about this. Your capital gain of 10,000, you only paid 1,500, correct? But the 10,000 went on your income for the provisional income test for your social security benefit. In the calculation, did I pay ordinary income tax on my social security then, or did I pay capital gains on my social security? Ordinary income. So now I'm paying 15% capital gain. Well, thank you, Jared. I appreciate that. Am I paying ordinary income tax on Social Security so my capital gain treatment did what to my Social Security? It caused it to be taxed, and at what rate? Ordinary income. When you start to stack up the tax advantages, the menu is unbelievable. Tax-favored treatment, the way we do it, is going to be so superior that if you actually schedule this correctly, your client should be able to take his life proceeds and his Social Security out completely tax-free by stalling your qualified plan and taking it out at 70 and a half. Is everybody with me on this? I don't want to go any farther than this part here so that we all get it because I think it's a huge, huge issue. Now, one of the big things is, is there could be money left over. I might actually die before age 100. If I set it up correctly, I can transfer whatever residual proceeds are left in my contract and I can hand that to whatever beneficiary I want, tax-free. Did you hear all the tax advantages? I've just given you eight. How many would like this sent to them? At the end of the show, if you sign up with Brokers Alliance, how do you like that pitch? I'll send you to my landing page. And one other thing that I want to bring up about this. When I'm looking at this from a strictly tax advantage point of view, I lay out all of these eight virtues, all of them. If I stall my qualified plan, I'm leaving my qualified plan to be exposed to the market another five to seven years. So I'm not going to touch it till 70 and a half. I should be able to take constructive receipt of tax-free Social Security as well as tax-free life insurance with withdrawals to basis or policy loans or if you're into arbitrage loans and you don't do withdrawals, it should be all tax-free. This is the advantage that we have. If you start talking about tax-free income at retirement, remember, I don't want to have any issues with Social Security. So when you think about the all-in, net spendable, take-home pay, if you do it correctly, you should be able to defeat any single retirement scenario that's out there on the street today. And with the exception of qualified plans that are matched by employers, which we still celebrate and we do that, that you got to do that, everything after that I'm looking at retirement money. I'd rather not pay, I'd rather pay a little tax on the seed then pay taxes on the harvest. Oh yeah, was that an amen? Wow, I appreciate that. Thank you. Now I want to talk about three things. There are three little. How many are okay with this? Do you mind me talking about this? 
How many have seen our illustrations? I have to say this with all due respect, they are to die for. And here's why. Because what we've done is, we've looked at the three different tactical issues of the code and employed them back into our illustration design. One is called Tefra in 1982. How many were doing business like Joe and I in 1982? Raise your hand. Well then, you remember the day that they made the rule in August? Def Tefra came online and they said, this is what they said. Guys, from now on, you can't take your gain out anymore first, right? Or I'm sorry, you can't take your basis out anymore. You have to take your gain out. So we went from what? FIFO, first in, first out, to LIFO. How many understand technically life insurance is not under the jurisdiction of TEFRA? Otherwise, you couldn't withdraw to basis, could you? Tax-free. But heads up, in the 1987 Technical Corrections Act, it says if there's any gain in the policy and you take any withdrawals in the day that you take it during the first 15 years, it's governed by a thing called the force out rule. And if you have gain and you withdraw, even though you think you're withdrawing to basis, it is exposed to a taxable event. Raise your hand if you knew what I just said. Wow. Well, Ken, I knew you'd know it. How many did not know what I just said? All right, well, then I would just say, now's the time to check in on your E&O policy. Think about it. Any withdrawals taken on any contract after 6-21-88 that have gain in the policy is subject to the Technical Corrections Act. If a force out occurs in your contract, you will pay a taxable event on what you thought was a withdrawal to basis. I'll tell you in a second. Thank you for that, though. He's not a plant. The question was, then what causes a force out? And by the way, it is an issue because the way we design the contract, we are suppressing the death benefit every time we can according to the code. If you suppress the death benefit all the way down to the Tamra and DEFRA corridor and you take withdrawals out and you have gain, you, that triggers a withdrawal event because you lowered the death benefit, it coincides going down. You violated the MEC rule, it's going to be a taxable event if you have gain. Of course, I had somebody in the audience about two years ago say, well, I don't worry about that because my contract doesn't have any gain during that period. And I said, if your contract doesn't have any gain in that period, you got the wrong contract. So you want to think about heads up, that's TEFRA. Now remember DEFRA? How many remember we used to do whole life contracts and one of the dividend elections was I could actually elect to take my dividends and let them go accumulation, and the accumulation cash values went over the death benefit. How many remember those days? Well, they changed the rules because we invented a thing called single premium whole life. Joe, do you remember those days? Oh my gosh, 11% minimum death benefit, and they said from now on, after June 21, 1988, we're gonna redefine what life insurance is and what an investment is. And that DEFRA corridor can never be violated. That's actually 14.972% difference between the cash value and the death benefit. It can never collapse below that. The only time it can become equal is at the endowment of the contract. Is everybody there? That's the only time it can be equal. If it was to violate the contract and the corridor, it would no longer be insurance. If it's no longer insurance, it's no longer tax deferred. Now, no carrier is going to allow the illustration software any longer to violate the corridor. So we already know going in that the DEFRA corridor is going to be in there to sustain. We also know that our cost of insurance is the most expensive part of our contract. If I can suppress the death benefit down to the DEFRA corridor and the TAMRA regs and keep it as a non-modified endowment contract, I'm reducing my costs. And if you haven't seen this, this is right on our website on the front page. I have an article, a three-page white paper on this whole issue where I talk about the expense loads of our contract. How many know we've taken it in the shorts by the press on issues like this, that our policy is really expensive? But in my brief, I also talk about the expense loads on mutual funds, which include the cost ratios, the registered investment advisory fee, and, and the SAI report, which does not is never inserted in the prospectus, and the client has to order it. Think about what I just said. The client has to order it to find out what transactions on trades and so forth that have happened inside the mutual fund. 
that SAI report averages 145 to 150 basis points on top of the 100 point RIA fee, on top of the 75 to 150 basis point on the expense ratio. I have no problem talking about my expense loads. I just want everybody else to disclose theirs. How's that? I'm just asking, well, thank you, Ken, I appreciate that. I felt like, how many feel like we're in a revival here? I'm just, re, I'm just re wrapping everything you've already known, except for I'm telling you it by the code. Tamra, if you understand her, and it's a her, let me tell you. When you understand, well, the, you know the three daughters, you know, uh, the IRS, Iris married Uncle Sam. They had three ugly daughters, right? Tefra, Defra, and Tamra, right? <laughs> or as we were, we're in the enrolled age of the IRS, we're talking about tax code. These guys are writing copious notes because all I'm doing is quoting sections of the code. How anal is that? I mean, these guys are writing down, they're taking copious notes. I'm like, I said section this and section that. They're like, oh, oh, the holy grail, you know? When we talk about using the Tamra provision, that means that when I look at a contract, and here's how it's going to go, and I want to walk you through it, because you're going to see the mechanics when you order an illustration. You're going to say, what are you guys doing? And what we're doing is we're trying to reduce the costs all along the way so that the clients all in expense loads at distribution, listen to this, is less than 100 basis points. Can I say it again so you don't freak out? During distribution, during distribution, my goal is to have expense loads at distribution less than 100 basis points. That's my goal. During the accumulation, I will suppress it as much as I can. Here's the rule of thumb, here's how it goes. If you do a 10 pay, and it's a 10 pay or less, I'm using level death benefit, lowest non-MEC Tamra. If I'm paying 13 contributions or more, I'm using increasing death benefit. And if I have a, a client asking me between 10 and 13, I have to run both because every carrier is different on this area, and I don't know which one's going to win. So I'm going to do level and increasing to see which one has the better number. Once you go down this road, you're going to understand that everybody's computer differences on Tamra is all over the board. Everybody's interpretation actuarially. That's why what we do is we take the top contracts, and right now we manage that at the indexed universal life level. And I look at the top five contracts in the United States. How many can predict what the S&P is going to do? Then what are you selling? You can't sell the historical. You can't sell the historical. By the, just a little heads up here. How many have a license? You won't have it long. All you have to do is be on tape. I shouldn't say tape anymore. Jealous. He's I'm a product of my own generation. If you're on digital recording saying, hey, the history of the s &P. By the way, Joe and I just looked at the Monte Carlo for the last 40 years, right? We just looked at the S&P all the way back to 1928. I can tell the client with historical accuracy that there's no 10-year bad boy section since 1928 where I'm going to make any less than 5-5. Five, five. Now, can I tell the client to bolster their, sol their solace in my sale? Can I tell them that he can expect that based on the historicity of the S&P? No. So what are you selling? If you're doing VUL and you're looking at your asset allocation model, and you're looking at the returns over 30 years, although I have to say, Joe and I fell off our chairs when the Ibbotson report reported at the end of 2011 that bonds eked out better than stocks did. Little heads up there, right? But if you're showing your IUL and you're showing the rate of return on this, what am I selling? 20 year look back, 30 year look back, are you crazy? You're selling the expense loads on the chassis. That's what you can sell. Is that, uh, is that craziness? Think about it. Can you tell your client they're going to pull down 8.3% because the carrier said they could on a 30-year look back? That's asinine. How many know that Index Universal Life was built to be 200 basis point over the current interest rate market? If our current interest rate market's at 45 I have no problem showing six and a half. Everything after that is blue sky. What do I sell? I sell who pays the least amount of expense loads on the contract. And how many know there's a difference between contractual guarantees 
and the current company practice of any carrier. That's why I have to look at both and tell the client, here's who we know illustrate. By the way, I have two rules of thumb. You want to see the best illustration on the street? I can do that for you. And I'll use the largest 9.1 30-year look-back rate, and it'll be huge. Huge. But if I show what I think is reasonable based on the construction and the design of an IUL, I'm showing about six to six and a half. And by the way, if I'm showing six to six and a half, just a little heads up, and I, I don't bring this as a promotion, I bring this only as an evidence. All of a sudden, I noticed that Mass Mutual elevated their dividend this year. Did you see that? How many of the participating whole life carriers that are into the income game did that? Not many. Their numbers at their 10, 20, and age 65 on their whole life contract for income now are awful close to indexing at six. Just a heads up, you're gonna see a whole, you're gonna see a whole new environment. So sometimes when I get down that low, I start looking at both. How many know that you're happy to hear that Steve's looking at every design issue on this? I'm gonna look at the VUL chassis, I'm gonna look at the index, I'm gonna look at a current company assumption UL with a cash value rider. I'm gonna look at all of this to see what's gonna develop the best possible income for the client and, and I might even have to look at whole life once in a while. And why do we do this? I said I selected on a, let's just do the more. How many, most of the people would you say if you sold income, how many are doing at least 15 years or longer on the illustration? Let's just see your hands. How many are doing less than that? You're showing 10 pays, seven pays, whatever. Most people are showing 15 or more. In my view, and if you didn't catch this on the Cheryl Moore Show, which is in our archives, just go right to our home page. You'll see a big red button on the page that says on demand video, click on it. As soon as you click on it, go to Cheryl Moore and look at her Index UL, our five-part series. And then go to the Wednesday show and watch your host drop his jaw when she says, you realize, Steve, that caps, participation rates, and spreads are irrelevant after 10 years. I said, whoa, 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 whoa. You're telling me that it doesn't matter what the cap rate is, what the spread is, what the participation rate is, whether I do five-year point-to-point, annual point-to-point, month-to-point-to-point, daily sweeps, once I get out 10, 11 years, none of this matters. It's just different ways of expressing the same mechanics. She said, that's right. I said, then why do we have all these moving parts? How hard is it for you to explain indexed universal life even though you sell it all day long? Think about it. Joe will give, notice I'm going to give this to Joe, not to me. Joe will give serious money if anybody can walk up to this pulpit and say exactly how it works. And yet we sell it all day long. Nobody can explain it. If you can't explain it to me, then how do you think your client's going to go if you ever have to go to arbitration? I mean, just think about it. When she told me that, I said, you can't, I thought this, I thought she'd fallen off the rails. And Cheryl said, that's right. Once we get into long-term positions, a lot of these moving parts are pretty much irrelevant. And if you haven't seen her five, of course, you say, I need a, I need a good educational, down and dirty boot camp. I would go out to that series and watch it in sequence, Monday through Friday show, and watch her build her case for IUL. And so, as you know, that show pulled 22,000 clicks when she was on. So, she's got a cult following. When I'm looking at the distribution, I'm ready to take distribution, and I'm going to go back into my computer. I already ordered the lowest Tamra non-MEC death benefit. Already ordered it. In my design, I want to know when the computer will allow me to drop the death benefit again. And I want to know when it will allow me to switch my option from increasing to level, and heads up, I can't do that simultaneously. You have to do them one at a time and in sequence. Otherwise, how many have had the computer stop you and say, you're, taking, you're going too early on the drop for you designers? And you said, how come that is? You can't take both at the same time. You have to do the DEFRA corridor first, find out when you can early, when the earliest possible time you can go ahead and drop the death benefit for a second time, and then, then you can go ahead and switch your increasing back over to level. 
Why do I care, Steve? You'll care, because it's 35 to 40 basis points internal rate of return on that contract just to do what I just said. By the way, the front-end design is another 80 basis points. My goal is to manage the cost of insurance all the way down the timeline so I can reduce and suppress it all the way to the ground. And when we did our Section 79 show with Ken and I, if you see all, any of you, if you quoted, we sent out a lot of illustrations on this, if you saw our five pay level, we dropped the death benefit just before distribution on that so that the contract would really milk the total income and keep the expenses as low as I could keep them. By doing these tactical issues under TEFRA, DEFRA, and TAMRA and managing the code, you can actually compete with anything, especially during distribution, if everybody's willing to give the all in. Now, here's a little side, a little side note. I think that when you have a tax, blended tax bracket of 21 to 22% or less, probably I'm not going to be able to overcome the expense loads during my accumulation period. I'm just telling you that's the way it is. But if my clients above the line, my tax savings, because it's coming out tax-free, will then mitigate my internal expenses during the accumulation phase. Is everybody there? If I'm in a higher, the higher the tax bracket, the more I love it. If I'm below in the 20s and the teens, I don't know if I should do it. Because the mechanics aren't there. If I'm looking to be as best as I can, because remember, our goal is net spendable income. More take home pay. Now, help me here. What are the words that we want to start using? Net spendable income. What's the next one? More take home pay. Net spendable income is how I measure everything. Now, once I have my income scenario, I just want to know how long should I let this go? Are you showing to age 100? How many show age 100? In, I think it was Time Magazine three weeks ago, four weeks ago, they said a person that is already alive today will be the first person, that person is alive, that will see age 150. A person somewhere in the world who's already on the earth. Now, I don't know if that's, you know, I'll need a perpetuity writer, Joe. <laughs> I'll need a perpetuity writer to make that happen. But think about it. People that are going to 85, 90, 95, age 100, right? I mean, baby boomers back in the day, baby boomer gals, right? They're the first ones that are diet conscious, right? They're working out. They're doing all these things. And look at the percentage of people who get super preferred females versus males, right? It's better. Here's the bombshell on income. And this is true, and I just told somebody last night this. I have not written one IUL for income on a male over a decade. Can I say it again? I have not written one male if it, the thing is for non-qualified income using life insurance, I have not used a male one time in the last decade. Why is that? Because the cost of insurance on a female is seven to eight years her counterpart cheaper. And what are the odds of me getting super preferred on a female versus just plain old preferred plus or preferred? The odds are much higher on a female. What's the spread in ages on a typical first marriage? Three years. Second marriage? 15 years. I don't know. No negative aspersion cast. Think about it, though. I'm taking a female, putting her on that chassis. I just bought myself 35 basis points rate of return equal to her counterpart, and the odds of me getting prefer, super preferred versus any other preferred is higher. But what happens when both people involved are problems? Then I punt to my secondary area, which is I want to find the next female in your family and use a surrogate insured. And remember, because we're suppressing the death benefit so low, am I going to really have much problems with justification? Because remember, we're buying the least amount of death benefit, so it's not a death benefit play. Most of this is going to fall underneath the financial justification. So anytime mom and dad are the problem, 
I punt to the second generation and look for the female who's got the best health. Father can still own it. Mother can own it. They can be the beneficiaries. They're just not the what? Insured. Why am I choosing this? Because I'm trying to mitigate the cost of insurance in every possible way that I can. I'm trying to lower it so that my expense loads are always the least amount on that chassis. Now, I don't know what chassis I'm going to use. I might use indexing. I might use current assumption UL. I might even have to go to par whole life. I really don't care. I might even have to do VUL. I'll have to do a tolerance risk test for the client to figure out what chassis. But isn't it cool that I can offer all four? To me, the broadness of our product line, think about it. Two of them are, in, one of them is interest-based. The other one's index-based. One of them's VUL and the other one's participating dividends. I have four different risk tolerance issues. You just tell me what the tolerance is for the client, I'll tell you what chassis it should go on. Because all the tax advantages that I just laid out are so huge, especially when I keep using the word net spendable income. So if you're not into the tax advantage income game, this is the time to do it. And what is the number one rider being added on all annuities right now? What's the number one rider on all annuities? Income. And by the way, is it time certain or is it forever? It's forever. Look at everybody's income. Everybody that's selling income riders are doing it, so what? What's the number one fear in America? And it isn't public speaking anymore. Outliving your retirement income. You should be diving into that. That should be your opening salvo on all your opening sales issues on tax advantaged income. Because why? It is the phobia of our entire baby boomer generation. They do not want to outlive it. Think about it, and I'm going to be talking about this this afternoon. Think about it, the Guinness Book of World Records, she died at 121. Is that out there? Is that too Star Trekian for you? I mean, think of it, 121. The, I, my wife is such a dietary exercise gal, she's got serious longevity on her side of the family, this girl's gonna see 100. Back in 2000, I visited a nursing home in 64th Street over on Greenway. And in that nursing home, there were three tricenturians at the time of the year 2000. Girls that were born in 19, 1899, still living. Think about it. All those gals that were in their 90s. And how many guys were there? A handful. Which puts a new twist on Jan and Dean's song, Two Girls for Every Guy. That was 9 to 1. Think about that, 9 to 1 in the nursing home. You thought your love life was dead? Hey, hey, check it out. Now I'm going to talk about the absurd. What happens when Steve wants to do income off an indexed UL or any other chassis? And I did this on a major case out of Cleveland some years back. We were bidding on a 162 double bonus. I sent my non mech illustrations in dutifully. I was up against everybody else, but I threw in one illustration, one, that nobody else threw in their portfolio when we were up against this bid. How many of you guys say, Steve, and this is income with a suppressed death benefit, the target exceeded a quarter of a million. How many would say, I'd like that sale? Okay, think about it. Everything I told you, I threw in there except one thing. I actually put inside this a MEC, I, a MEC IUL and annuitized it. Why did I do that? Why would I show such an absurdity? Think about it. I showed a MEC contract. I went below the Tamara regs. I went, butted it up right against Tefra Corridor. And then instead of taking it out with draw, I just annuitized it for life. Because I noticed that the annuitization rates on the 1980 CSO when we did this were still not updated. They updated the life insurance rates, but they hadn't updated the annuitization rates, and I noticed today a curious thought. Everybody has to be on the 2001 CSO, but I noticed, I noticed that annuitization rates didn't seem to keep pace with the new upgraded life insurance pricing. Now, did I sell the annuitization one? Of course I didn't, but I was the only one showing it, and because I showed all the scenarios that you could pull off of this, we got the case. Why? On a stupidity. Think about it. On a stupidity, we won the case. Everybody's income was very similar. The only difference is I threw in another alternative. 
That's all I did. Every time I show something and I have an anomalous issue that I know probably will never get sold, but I'm the only one bringing it to the table, I'm throwing it in the bid. Because what does that say to the client about you? You looked at every scenario, taxable and what? Tax free. You need to start thinking outside the nine dots because this is the kind of item that we do every day at Brokers Alliance to cut ourselves out of the pack. What makes us distinctive in our distribution methods using income off a of life insurance chassis? It's idiot issues like this that, yes, 99% of the time it will never get placed, but I'm the one that brought it up. Do you see the difference? Um, can I take questions?